In this lecture, we're going to take a look at what doing a log log plot can give you. And in particular, I'm calling this lecture the power of log log plots because that's a clue. So if you're trying to figure out that there's some relationship between two quantities, and both of our examples from this lecture will be biological, if you think one is related to the power of another, like y equals something times x to the p, you can discover what that power is using a log log plot. Throughout this lecture, every time that I say the word log, I mean natural log in my computations because I just always take the natural log by default, but you could do all of the same calculations doing log base 10 if you prefer that log, or you could do log base four for some reason if you like, you'll get the same result. So you don't have to pick the correct logarithm in order to find the power laws. You just have to pick a logarithm. Either natural log or log base 10 would be standard choices. The classic example of this comes from 1932 with Professor Max Kleber from UC Davis. He was a professor of animal husbandry, and in particular, as he was looking at animal data, he realized that there was some relationship between the mass of an animal, say measured in kilograms, and what we call its metabolic rate per day, given in kilocalories. So that's the amount of calories that they consume per day. I took this set of data from a 1947 article by Max Kleber. I'm not sure it's his original 1932 data, but it's pretty close. Now, if we look at this data, we see that as the mass goes up, the metabolic rate goes up. But it's not in a linear fashion. So just because one animal is more massive than the other, like let's say four times more massive, does not mean that that animal consumes four times more calories per day. I'm not totally sure the numbers off the top of my head, but I think rats eat 10% of their body weight per day or maybe more. But humans certainly do not, nor would a whale. In order for a whale to eat 10% of its body weight per day, it would just have to eat an enormous amount of food. So while as the mass increases, the metabolic rate increases, more massive animals eat proportionally fewer calories per day than smaller animals. So in order to figure out exactly how the scale up works, what Kleber did was take the log of both of these sets of data. I put here a slide ruler because in 1932, if you wanted to calculate a logarithm, you would either do it by hand with a slide ruler, or if you had like a reference table, you might be able to look up your logarithm. Kleber definitely didn't have something like a calculator that could compute log nor MATLAB to do the plot for him. In order to take a bunch of logarithms, it was a pretty tedious process. Luckily, we have MATLAB. So what we're going to do is take this data, plot it in MATLAB. We'll see that there's a relationship, but it's not a linear one. Then we'll take the log of both sets of data in order to discover the power law relating these two quantities. Okay, so let's switch over to MATLAB. Here's the data that Kleber had. So I've put it all in a two column matrix in MATLAB and specifically the mass quantities went into the first column and the metabolic rate went into the second column. So first, let's just scatter these data points and see if we can spot some sort of pattern that might lead us to a function modeling this data. So we'll do scatter mass rate and I'll make them filled. I think the dots make it a little bit hard to see what's going on because they're a bit large. So let me try size 10. We have some data points which are up here in the top right area of the graph. You can think about, you know, what's going on there. Should you perhaps break the animal kingdom up by size or something like that? We have a lot of data down in this lower left region. Okay, just looking at this, it's not really a straight line. Let's see if we can make it a little bit bigger. It's not really a straight line, almost, not quite. It has almost like a square root shape, especially around here. It certainly seems like there's some kind of pattern as we go up with the mass, we go up with the metabolic rate. So we expect there to be a relationship between the two, but it's still mysterious what it is. So let's try perhaps doing log of the rate. Maybe it's exponential or something like that.
Okay, if anything, that seems to have exaggerated this kind of concave down shape. You could try log of the mass instead. Let's do log of mass and just rate. That almost looks like exponential growth or something like that. You could also just try guessing powers. So you could try like rate squared. Right, but right now we're just guessing. So let's try what Kleber did. He did the log of both. And there's a reason why, there's a mathematical reason why we'll see. But let's try log of both. And there it is. This data looks a lot like it lives on a line. Let's ask MATLAB for the coordinates of that line. So how about polyfit? We're fitting a line through the log of both. So it's not going to be mass comma rate. It's going to be log of mass comma log of rate comma one. Okay, so those are the coordinates. We could now set up an anonymous function. So I'll have f is polyval c for x. The independent variable is x. Let's just call it that. It's just a name for the function. And we're going to plug x into a polynomial whose coordinates are given by the c vector up above. Anyway, all that to say that that's how you combine polyfit and polyval. And then we will do hold on f plot f. And what I would like to do is specify the domain of f using the fact that we've plotted mass down here on the x-axis. So we'll do the minimum of that log mass vector through the maximum of the log mass vector. Okay, so there you can see our line of best fit. What we're going to do now is go back to the slides. I'm going to take these two coordinates and show how to convert that into a mathematical model. Right now we have a model for this log log plot. How do we translate that back now into a relationship between mass and rate without having the log of both? So what does this give us? Okay, so here's our formula that we can write down for the straight line that we were able to graph in MATLAB. I took these coefficients right out of the calculation that we did for the vector C using the polyfit command. So we have natural log of the metabolic rate equals 0.75 times natural log of the mass plus 4.21. These are rounded. And in particular, if you look back at the computation, it didn't really round to 0.75. I think it was 0.76, but I'm going to round to 0.75 for two reasons. One is that 0.75, I think, is what Kleber actually got. It's often called the three-quarter power law. And two, there's no real reason why we would insist on 0.76 over 0.75 in this particular model because we didn't have a data set that was really reflective of the entire animal kingdom. So if we're trying to make a law about how mammals work or how all animals work, our data set can give us some guidelines, but we shouldn't insist that our model is exactly the right model for all animals, right? So we had a very small subset of all of the animals which have ever lived. And then there are other considerations like were the animals all under similar life conditions when their metabolic rates were measured? You could have two humans who might be similarly massive, but one runs marathons and the other doesn't, and they eat differently accordingly. So, you know, whenever you're looking at this data for both this metabolic rate calculation and also the heart rate calculation, you try very hard to have standardized measurements so that if you measure an animal heart rate, they're all resting. You're not measuring one animal that was just running versus an animal which has been napping. But of course you have to allow that the data is not going to be perfect. Okay, so what does this tell us about R and M, how they relate to each other? Well, their natural logs give us a straight line, but we would like a formula that's just in terms of R and M. So what we're going to do is undo these natural logs by exponentiating both sides. So I'm going to take e to the left-hand side equals e to the right-hand side. Okay, so on the left we have e to the natural log of r. That's just going to give us r. 
And on the right, I'll do the entire right hand side. So we'll do e to the 0.75 natural log of m plus 4.21. On the left, e and natural log are inverse functions. R is a positive number that all checks out. So we're just left with r on the left. On the right, we have e to the something plus something. We can split that up into the product of two exponentials. So we'll do e to the 0.75 natural log of m times e to the 4.21. Now how you simplify the first term is, is really key here. Sometimes I'll see students who have a similar construction, maybe they have a number instead of m and they just plug everything into their calculator and they're not really thinking about what's going on here. But you have e to the product of two terms. If you relate that to a law of exponentiation, we know that e to the a to the b would be e to the a times b. So that's what we're looking at here is, is the product. So let's undo that product. And what we could do, let me do it off to the side, is e to the 0.75 to the natural log of m. That would be correct, but it wouldn't be useful because e to the 0.75 isn't any particular nice number. And then we would have some random number to the natural log of m. And I'm trying to get to m, so this is bad. What we do is we switch them. It's a product, so we can just switch the order. Think of it as natural log of m times 0.75. So if we write e to the natural log of m to the 0.75, we'll get some nice cancellation, times e to the 4.21. e to the 4.21 is just a number. Let me put it in front. So we'll have e to the 4.21. I'm just doing that because constants usually go out front. And then where we have e to the natural log of m, that's just going to be m to the 0.75. So now we get the shape of the relationship between r and m. So in particular, because I don't want to focus too much on that leading number, let me write r equals c m to the 3 quarters. That's the relationship between mass and metabolic rate. This is the 3 quarters law that Kleber discovered. For us, with the data that we have, if you're wondering, c is approximately 67. 0.4, let's say, 0.36. That's the constant that I get from the limited data set that I'm looking at. But if you're looking at a bigger data set, it might be something like 68 or 65 or something like that. But the point here is really this three quarter power. So what we get here is as m scales up, r scales up, but it's not as much as r to the one, right? That would be a linear rate. It's less than that. So as the mass scales up, yes, r also scales up, but it also scales up in a way that's sort of concave down. It's kind of between like a square root shape and a line. So it's sort of between the two. I think we saw that in the graph. It's kind of concave down, especially on the left side of the picture. So the metabolic rate increases at a decreasing rate, if you know what I mean. Here is an actual hand-drawn graph by Max Kleber himself. So in particular, he didn't have computers that could take logarithms for him, nor did he have MATLAB to do the plots. So this was the plot he created. I'm not sure what these straight lines are. One of them is labeled surface, which I imagine is perhaps the surface area of the animal. The one that's measured weight, I'm not sure. But you can see what he discovered that by taking the log of each quantity, there's a linear relationship between the metabolic rate and the mass of the animal. He has some animals on here that weren't from our data set, like whale and elephant. So again, I'm not sure that the data we have exactly matches his original data set, but it's gonna illustrate the same law. Let's return to this data set that we've seen before. So we saw earlier that there was a relationship between the mass of an animal and its pulse rate. So here we're comparing mass to the heart rate in beats per minute. Slightly different data set than what we were just looking at. In this data set, we see an inverse relationship. 
as the mass increases, the pulse goes down. So if you have a dog or cat at home, your heart rate is probably slower than your dog or cat's. We used a proportionality argument to show that you could model this using a negative one-third power, and it wasn't a bad model. It illustrated the overall relationship between the two. It's a useful model if you wanted to make a prediction. But it turns out we can do a little bit better with this data set if we use a log-log plot. So let's switch back into MATLAB, and we will plot this time the log of the mass and the log of the pulse rate will fit a line to that data set, and we'll see a different power than negative one thirds. It's close, but it's a little bit different, and that will be our second model for this data. Okay, now we're back in MATLAB, and I have here the mass vector that we've seen before, as well as the heart rate vector. I think I'm still including that bat data here, but that's okay, we'll just leave it. If you like on your own later, you can explore how it would change if you remove that bat data, which we did when we did the proportionality argument, but we'll just leave it here for now. Okay, over on the right, we have mass on the x-axis and heart rate on the y-axis. And compared to the metabolic data, here we see an inverse relationship. So as mass scales up, heart rate goes down. So a very small animal can have a resting heart rate of hundreds of beats per minute, which is not at all the case when you look at like a human or an elephant. In the lecture on proportionality, we derived a power law between these two quantities using a proportionality argument. This time we're gonna derive a new power law. It's gonna be slightly different, a little bit better, using log log. So let's see if that looks like the right thing to do. So we'll take log of M and log of R. And if there's a power law, what we should see looks like a straight line. And yeah, it does. We have a couple data points. One of those is probably the bat. I'm not sure about the other one. But in general, we see what looks like a linear relationship here with a negative slope, again, because as mass goes up, heart rate goes down. Okay, let's find the coefficients for that line of best fit. So I'll call it C and we'll do polyfit. We wanna fit a line through the log log plot. So we do log M log R degree one. The slope of our line of best fit is about negative 0.25. The y-intercept is about 7.07. .07. So those will be the coordinates we use to find the power law between them. What we wanna do is take the equation natural log of r equals negative one quarter natural log of m plus 7.07 .07 and exponentiate both sides, just like we did before. So on the left, we'll have e to the natural log of r and on the right, we'll have e to the entire right-hand side first. So let's write negative 0.25 natural log of m plus 7.07. .07. Now we just use properties of, of exponentiation. On the left, we're just gonna get r. That's the heart rate. On the right, I'm gonna write e to the negative 0.25 natural log of m e to the 7.07. .07. Okay, we just have to simplify the right-hand side. So let's bring that e to the 7.07 .07 out in front. That's just a constant, whatever that number is. And then just like before, I'm gonna reorder the terms in that exponent so that it's first e to the natural log of m all to the negative 0.25. Okay, that leading constant, I could just call it C. It's not really important, right? What's important here is, is the rest of the expression, the power law that we're looking for. But let me go ahead and exponentiate 7.07. .07. We're rounding here. So let's say that this is 1176.15. Probably somewhere out there, you can find this exact analysis done with a larger data set or maybe a more refined data set, breaking it into certain subclasses of mammals or something like that. And the constant might be a little bit different. But again, what's key here is what happens with the other term. So e to the natural log of m becomes just plain old m to the negative one quarter power. And typically we leave it like that. So our relationship is r equals some constant times m to the negative quarter. Or if you wanted to, you could take that constant and write it over m to the one fourth power if you didn't like that negative exponent.
Let's take a quick look at what our data looks like for mass and heart rate with this new model. So this is what we had before. Let me go back to M and R and I'm going to create a function, which is now our power law function. So we'll have F is an anonymous function of, how about M? And it's going to be 1176.15 times M to the negative one quarter. Okay, so that's our function of M. And so we will do an F plot of F from the minimum of the mass vector. I think I'm just calling it M through the maximum. So that gives us the right domain for our function. We plot this. You can see the function that we have now, this negative quarter power function that's modeling this data. It's a little hard to judge whether or not this is a good fit because all the data is squashed up over here. So let's see if we can maybe zoom in a little bit using the axis command. Let's try first just shrinking the, the horizontal axis. So how about we go through masses up to, let's cut off at 70,000. So from zero to 70,000, zero to nth. Nth means, hey, MATLAB, you choose my upper bound for the y-axis. Okay, so there I've zoomed in on the left and you can see it looks pretty good around here where we can really see. You can always zoom in a little bit more. So if we did something like 1,000, what does it look like if we're looking at fairly small animals? Okay, that maybe is not really illustrative enough. Okay, well, there you go. I don't know how convincing that is, but we did fit a pretty good looking power law to this data. If you step back and look at maybe the whole thing, I think 10,000 was a pretty good picture. This is neat because the other law we saw had a three quarter power. Here we have a negative one quarter power. Those aren't the only two examples from the animal kingdom where there's some relationship usually to do with the size of the animal and some other quantity and the relationship between them is a quarter power or a multiple of a quarter power, like one four, three fourths, etc. So it's kind of a neat thing and it's not totally explained. So why is it one fourth? Why is it three fourths? They're a little bit mysterious. Now there have been approaches to explaining this and very convincing approaches in my opinion. And what they use is the kind of proportionality argument that we saw previously. So we already solved this problem using a proportional argument. We got negative one third power instead of negative one fourth. It looked pretty good. It wasn't a bad model. This is a little bit better. But the proportionality argument was just a simplified version of what people have done to try to explain these quarter power laws. Our proportionality argument was really based on sweeping generalizations about like the entire surface area, the entire volume, how blood flow works in all animals. And if you get a little bit more refined, you might tweak some of those exponents. So in particular, there were three scientists in the late 90s, Wes Brown and Inquist, who published some work on showing very good proportionality arguments that can explain these powers. I can't duplicate their results out loud, but basically they had the same sort of area volume type proportionality approaches to it, but they really looked at how networks of blood vessels can branch, kind of like how you have fractals that exhibit self-similarity. So like when you zoom in, you see the same shape object, no matter how much you zoom in. We have similar properties with our blood vessels. So something like a large artery can split into two, and then that might split again, and that might split again. And every time they split, they get smaller, right? So they really looked into that level of detail in order to try to justify where these power laws come from. So mathematically, just using log log plots, we've seen what the relationship should be approximately based on the data we have. So on the one hand, you have, does this model work? Is it useful? Can we make predictions with it? And on the other hand, you have, what does this model mean? What is this telling us about the animal's body? Why is it true? So these are sort of different questions. I would say the first one is, is easy to answer, especially if we have MATLAB instead of slide rulers. The other one takes a little bit more understanding of biology. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this look at log log plots. Anytime you're suspicious that data might be described with a power law, 
try to do a log log plot. You might discover something. Thank you for your attention.